tonight is Maka Pucha. Maka is the name of the month. It's a full moon, usually in February, sometimes in March. Pucha means to pay homage. We're not paying homage to the month or the moon, we're paying homage to the Buddha and to his disciples. It was, on, it was on this day in the first year of his teaching career, full moon of this month, when 1,250 of his Arahant disciples all came uninvited. And he gave them a talk called the Ovada Bhadi Moka, which is a summary of the main points of the teaching. And then he sent them out to teach. Because those 1,250 arahants probably were the thousand arahants who became arahants simply on hearing the fire sermon, plus the 250 who were fellow students of Sariputta and Moggallana. And they too, for the most part, became arahants on hearing only one Dharma teaching. And so the Buddha wanted to make sure that they had a rounded view of how to teach even though they themselves didn't need any more teaching for their own sake, but for the sake of the rest of us, to make sure that this teaching would spread far and wide and be a solid teaching, a complete teaching. The Buddha taught everything from basic things like patience, not having ill will to other people, not, having, not saying harsh, hateful things to other people all the way up to what he called being committed to the heightened mind, or purifying the mind. It was the whole range of teachings. We don't have a record of the whole talk. We do have a record, though, of the main points. And of them, probably the most famous is the set of three verses, Sambha Bapa Sakkaranang Kusala Subha Sambhara Sajjitta Bariyoda Bhannang Etang Bhutana Sasanang not doing any evil at all, developing your skillfulness until it's fully developed, cleansing the mind until it's bright and clear. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. That's to remind us that it's, we don't just have one Buddha. The Dharma is always the same. No matter how many Buddhas gain awakening, this is the Dharma they all teach. Sometimes you hear the Buddha said that everything changes, therefore the Dharma has to change too. But he never said that. Fabricated things change, that's true. But the way of the Dharma never changes. Which is why it's a teaching that's relevant now, as relevant now as it was back then. It starts with that first one, not doing any evil at all. This can refer to your thoughts, your words, your deeds. And it means you really have to be on top of yourself, because it's so easy to say, well, I can slack off a little bit today, maybe don't have to push myself so hard, and do a little evil thinking or a little evil speech. It's not going to be too bad. I've got lots of good stuff. It'll balance out the account. But that's not the attitude of the Buddha. The Buddha says you want to be very careful about everything that goes through your mind everything you say, everything you do, because those are your real, your, your real treasures, your real belongings. Your physical belongings are yours for only for a while, but your actions, those are yours. And so of course you want nothing but good in terms of the results, which means that you have to make sure you don't do any bad causes. The same principle with bringing your skillfulness to a high level of consummation. You want to keep asking yourself, what more can I do in my thoughts, words, and deeds that would make them more skillful? The Buddha said that his own awakening was due to the fact that he never let himself rest content with the level of skillfulness he'd attained. If there was more to learn, more to do, he was willing to do it. If you want to identify with anything, identify with that desire, to be always willing to learn. And then finally cleansing the mind, noticing whatever in the mind would make you want to do something unskillful or would get in the way of doing what is skillful. 
You want to cleanse those qualities away, like right now as you're meditating. Any sensual desires come up, you want to put them to the side. Any ill will, put it to the side. Any drowsiness, torpor, you want to wake yourself up. You can't let these things take over the mind. You have to recognize them, that they're hindrances. And the same for restlessness and anxiety, worries about the future, and uncertainty. Uncertainty here means not being certain about the path. Well, what have you got to do? Pretty simple. Just stay with the breath. Try to be at ease with the breath. Find a level of breathing that feels soothing and energizing at the same time. The one that goes deep down refreshes the entire body and refreshes the mind. As John Fuhrer once said, if you're going to doubt anything, at least don't doubt the breath. As long as you know it's coming in, it's going out, you've got something you can hang on to. This is something you know is happening. And then as your mind begins to gather around that, you begin to know the mind as well. It's because of the mind when it's not trained. It's scattered all over the place. And this is one of the reasons why it needs to be cleaned, because as it gets scattered all over the place, it just kind of splashes around. And when you're not ta taking that much care about what you're doing, it's obvious that greed, aversion, and delusion are going to slip in. It's when you gather the mind together, that's when you begin to realize, oh, this is the state of my mind right now. Some people say they don't like to meditate because, well, they say they can't meditate because their minds are too scattered or they have too many defilements. It's like saying, I can't, can't go see the doctor right now, I'm too sick. If you're sick, you've got to see the doctor, no matter what. And the same with a mind that hasn't been well cared for. You have to put up with the fact that you're going to see a lot of your own defilements. Your greed comes up, your aversion comes up. So you sit with those things for a while. But then in the midst of that, you try to hold on to the breath. And as you do, you begin to realize that there is a part of the mind that is clear, that is still, in spite of all these other things. And so hold on to that and use whatever determination or whatever discernment you can to weaken the things that would pull you away. This is when you get the mind gathered together here. That's when you can cleanse it. That's when you can make it bright. If it's scattered around, who knows what the different thoughts are getting into. You clean up one set of thoughts and you find another has gone out and playing in the mud again. When you've got everybody right here, that's when you really can cleanse the mind. And this leads to that other teaching about the mind, is lifting the mind. So that's a heightened has a heightened quality. This refers to getting the mind into concentration, but also lifting it above its ordinary concerns. Seeing that a lot of the things that you're concerned with out in the world are really not worth that much after all. Not worth getting worked up about, and certainly not worth getting involved in in a way that's going to give rise to more greed, aversion, and delusion. So you learn how to use your discernment to lift the mind, to realize that the things that would pull it away are not nearly as important as this quality of having the mind clear and clean and still here in the present moment. Because it's from this stillness and clarity that you can see things clearly and have a sense of what's right, what's wrong, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. And when you have that sense, then you can depend on yourself. Before that time, you have to depend on other people. This is what the Buddha said, admirable friendship is an important part of the path. In fact, without it, you can't practice. But you can't depend on your friends to be telling you everything. No matter how admirable they are, no matter how wise and compassionate they are, they can't be on your case all the time. You've got to learn to be on your own case. It means you have to learn how to take delight in abandoning and take delight in developing, i.e. developing skillful qualities, abandoning unskillful qualities. The more you can find joy in that, the more you can depend on yourself. And it's the joy of learning skillfulness. That's what brightens the mind, cleans the mind. 
because otherwise you're going to go back and you're going to find delight in greed, aversion, and delusion again. You go back to your old ways. But if you really can find delight in this, you realize that it's a much higher form of well-being, a much more satisfying, gratifying form of happiness, one that feels good all the way down. This way you develop a mind that you can respect, your own mind that's been trained and cleansed and lifted up beyond its ordinary concerns. Because you begin to see as the mind gets cleansed, it's capable of a lot more good than you would have imagined, and it can bring a lot more happiness. As the Buddha said, if it were the case that by developing skillful qualities in the mind it brought unhappiness or pain, he wouldn't teach them. But it's because it's the skillful qualities of the mind that bring true happiness. That's why he taught them. And if it were impossible to develop skillful qualities, again, he wouldn't teach them. But it is possible. It means that true happiness is possible. If we learn to look at our thoughts, our words and deeds, see if there's anything in there that's unskillful. It can be harmful to ourselves, harmful to other people. But try to clean it away, clean it away. Develop all the good, skillful qualities of the mind, all the good potentials you have inside. And those two activities will help you cleanse the mind, so the mind will be bright, a light to itself, filled with a light of discernment. Those candles that we were carrying around the salad today, tonight, those stand for discernment. The flowers stand for concentration, the mind that blooms. The incense stands for virtue. Let's say the, the fragrance of virtue is greater than any other fragrance in the world, because it can go against the wind. Other fragrances can only go downwind, but this one goes against the wind. The person is virtuous, is attractive to other people. So the incense stands for virtue, the flowers stand for, for concentration, and then the candles, the light of the candles stands for discernment. So when we're offering these things to the Buddha, we're reminding ourselves that these are the things that the Buddha really wants us to do in homage. As I said, true homage to him was actually practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma. So for the rest of the hour, pay homage to the Buddha and his noble disciples by practicing the way they did, or as close as you can to the way they did. We take refuge in them so that we can learn how to develop the qualities inside ourselves so we can take refuge in ourselves, that brightened quality of the mind that we can attain by training it. <clears throat> 